This conversation that we're about to listen to is really, really powerful. I sat down with Jerry Kalana, and there's so much gold that he has to offer, and it's super relevant with everything that's going on today with pandemic, and then protests, and now riots, and looting, and all that stuff. Um, he talks about leadership and the art of growing up. That's, in fact, the subtitle of his book called Reboot. And the whole concept is that, that what we're suffering from is a pandemic of leaders that haven't grown up. Like, that's really the bigger underlying issue, is leaders that haven't grown up. I would extend it to say population that hasn't grown up, right? But that process of growing up is so critical for everything that we need to do as a society right now. And, and it's also the tool for you to, to uh, go past the suffering that you might be experiencing. And he talks about another thing, which is how everybody experiences suffering. Everyone has suffering, grief, loss, pain in their lives. And the only way out is that we can have compassion for each other. We each have our own gift to give, and yours is unique. What reality you want to create? It's your choice, always. No one can take that from you. Hello, everyone. I am Kelvin Corelli. I'm here with Jerry Colana, which I'm super pumped to be speaking with Jerry today because I've known Jerry for how long now? Like 10 years, I think. I discovered yeah, you yeah, when, yeah. I, yeah, when I got into this uh, spiritual entrepreneurship journey. Um, I quickly discovered Jerry as one of the voices in that space that was talking about that, which was pretty rare at the time. And um, I've you know, loved the interactions that we've had over the years. I've sat on your couch in your office in flat iron and just, you know, thought I was in the middle of a sentence and then um, it was just an ordinary sentence and then like tears started flowing and you're like, don't worry, this happens all the time. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the pheromone I give off. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. There's got to be something in the air, man. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so like super excited to have you on and, um, and to see you again. Mm -hmm. um, so tell people a little bit about your background on how you came to this, please. Came to coaching. Yeah, came to this work that you're yeah. doing and the book that you have, Reboot. Um, everything that you're about that you're doing now. Um, well, I'll try not to be as long-winded as I usually am. And before I even answer that question, I'll say thank you for having me on the show. It's a delight. And I remember, I have this vague memory of us sitting near each other at a Wisdom 2.0 conference. Mm, um, yes, that, that and, happened, and, yes. And, uh, uh, and so I was trying to remember what Wisdom 2.0, because I haven't been to many, what, mm. at, what, which of those were we at? So it, it was probably I think it was in 13. Ago. I think it was, was it in 13? Now. Okay, so set, or that 12, was seven. 12 or it could be 12 also. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess a bit of my own... Um, journey. Um, I've been many things in my life. I have been a journalist in my 20s, which then led to uh, a gig as a venture capitalist um, in early in the web 1.0 days. Um, as I like to uh, tease my kids, uh, I invented the goddamn internet. And if you don't like it too bad, um, no, I'm kidding. And then um, uh, as a successful venture capitalist, I hit a uh, very profound midlife depression that altered the trajectory of my life uh, dramatically. Um, I then wandered for a number of years as a wandering board member in consultant, and then um, eventually started training to become a coach and um, went out on my own as a solo practitioner. Uh, and now six years ago, uh, I and three other dear friends, siblings from other mothers, um, founded, co-founded a company called Reboot, Reboot.io. And uh, last June, um, published my book, uh, my first, um, reboot and the leadership in the art of growing up which in many ways is a sort of um, 
summation, if you will, of some of the most important belief systems I have, which include the notion that better humans make better leaders, as you well know, and that uh, we should use the very difficult practice of leading to complete the process of becoming the adults that we were born to be. And that leaders yeah. who do that end up leading better than leaders who don't. Yeah. I mean, and this is, this is why I'm so attracted to, to you and your work, because that is exactly how I look at things. That's exactly been my journey, right? I was just going over your, your book again here this morning and rereading the introduction. And I, I kind of feel like just reading from it, if you're okay with that, because it's, so, mm -hmm. it's, sure. so, it's just so clear and so succinct. So it opens, you open the book by saying, I didn't set out to write a book about growing up. But as those who've attempted to get their thoughts down on paper know, the true nature of the book revealed itself after I'd begun to, the excavations behind a simple question. What do I believe to be true about work, leadership, and how we may live our lives? Mm. The simplicity of the answer startled me. I believe that better humans make better leaders. I further believe that the process of learning to lead well can help us become better humans. By growing, the meet, to, by growing to meet the demands of the call to leadership, we're presented with a chance to finally fully grow up. It's a pretty good paragraph. It is, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it's good writing, man. It's good writing. <laughs> it is. But that, I mean, that's the, that's the thing. Like for, so for me as an entrepreneur, right, I love, I love business. I love making product. I love, you know, marketing mm -hmm. and sales and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, attracting people and leading the team and all that. But really, I think somewhere inside the reason I do that and the reason I've done that hasn't been for the results, right? For the money, for mm -hmm. you know, the accolades or any of that. It's mm -hmm. been that knowing that this is, my, that this is how I kind of face the world and, and put myself in situations where I grow up, right? Mm -hmm. And I've had a lot of growing up to do, to be frank, mm -hmm. right? Um, Welcome to being human. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> um, so I, I just love that you put it in those terms because it's, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's so uncommon, right? Like most, mm -hmm. most people, they're like, okay, here's your meeting rhythm or like the, <laughs> the things to say. Or like, and that stuff's fine, it's, it can be useful, but so much less powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's, what's been your, um, What's been the, the reaction? What has been your experience of, of having this conversation with people? Is that? Well, that's, that's actually what it has felt like. It's felt like um, both an extension of, but an expansion, but as well, an expansion of the, uh, a conversation I've been having for many, many years, both with myself and, and with others. And... Um, I have been surprised, pleasantly so, by um, the things that have emerged since the book has come out and the conversations that I've had. Um, for example, um, one of the things that has surprised me and delighted me <clears throat> recently is, you know, here we are talking in May in the midst of a global pandemic. And... Um, the thing that I did not anticipate, because I did not anticipate a pandemic, was the fact that people are actually finding comfort in the book today. Mm. And that is really wonderful. Um, a couple of other insights and observations I would make. Early on, <clears throat> when the galley first came out, the uncorrected proofs, I remember a dear friend um, sending me a snapshot of her copy um, and it was dog-eared and it had those little post-it flags, uh, you know, probably a hundred marking each different page. <clears throat> and I remember crying seeing that image because there's nothing more that I wanted than to write a book that people would respond to in a way where they would underline and highlight and write in the margins and argue with me 
and be challenged with me by me. Um, and, and so the book is, <clears throat> for example, every chapter ends with a series of what I call journaling invitations, questions that relate to the point that I was trying to make in the book, you know. Um, the first chapter, which is a very difficult chapter for many people to, to read, is um, because it's very revealing about some of the trauma that I experienced as a kid. Um, it's really intended to provoke a conversation with oneself about one's relationship to money, which I think is foundational in, when we think about our relationship to work. So there's that. But maybe the most surprising thing that's happened <clears throat> occurred early on. Um, I remember doing a book reading. I've done dozens of book readings now. And I remember doing a book reading and I arrived in Denver and there were about 80 entrepreneurs who had lined up um, or come to the event. And I, before it started, I was wandering outside. I was, on, I was taking a phone call and um, this older woman, she must have been in her late 70s, walking with a cane, uh, came up to me and she said, you look like our speaker. And I laughed and I said, I am your speaker. And she said, and shook, stuck out her hand. And she said, my name is Margaret. I read your book after hearing you on uh, Krista Tippett's show on being. And um, I got your book, I read your book. And I want you to know that your story is my story. Now, the reason I bring attention to this is that she is not what I envisioned right. when I wrote the book, right? I, I envisioned a relatively young leader um, uh, just fresh on their journey. And she went on to explain that she grew up in Oklahoma City. Her parents had survived the Dust Bowl. She ended up becoming the CEO of a company that she started. She retired. And I was just struck by the fact that here I was, I grew up in Brooklyn, she grew up in Oklahoma City, child of the depression and the, 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 the dust bowl. And she found resonance. And so what I did not realize at the time was the extent to which these themes are universal. You know, Calvin, your response doesn't surprise me. Um, oh, this is what I have believed to be true. I think what's, what's been going on is that people have actually not been talking about it, not in a widespread way. So as I said, that was long-winded. I promised to not be, and I was, so. <laughs> That's great. I love that. I love that image of, of her walk, walking up to you, and like it's so surprising who, who resonates with, with that. Mm with that message and the story. But as you said, like, we're all, we're all humans. We're all on this journey. Right. I remember when That's I was right. going through my divorce and things were really ch tough back in, in 2011. Um, and you, so we must've connected maybe yeah, right really. around that time before that, right on online. And you sent me a link to this book, uh, finding meaning in the second half of life. Right. Which, By James Hollis. Yeah. Which was, you know, a life changer. So, just right there with just a <laughs> reference to a book, you'd already changed my life. So pretty incredible. Yeah. Well, very Hollis, cool. that, that, that book in particular is a very, very powerful book, but I smiled at the memory of that because now I remember doing that. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my relationship with words and writing, uh, you know, I talk about this in the book is, is very profound. And I remember feeling like uh, people would come to see me and it was almost like I would take out a prescription pad and I would write the name of a book <laughs> for yeah. them to read. It's like, mm -hmm. you, you need Hollis. <laughs> this person <laughs> needs Parker Palmer. Or that person right. needs Pema Children. So, yeah. um, and I still do that. I still, I still um, uh, make recommendations in that way, write prescriptions. Um, for me, the, it's, uh, there's something profoundly moving about having a book that uh, can alter the trajectory of your life. And uh, to go back to it for a moment, for some folks, my book has done that. And that just makes me feel like I'm paying back the teachers who so influenced me in my life.
Yeah, and that, that intention you know, really flows through, not just in your book, but mm-hmm. I feel like in all of your, all of your work and all the, the different environments I've seen you in. I'm curious about if, uh, if you would, because uh, I think a lot of people would, uh, our relationship to money is generally so messed up, right, as a society. <laughs> so I think a lot of people would really appreciate sort of a uh, Jerry's, like, what is it about relationship to money? How do we, how do we uh, mature in our relationship to money? Mm. Can you? What a brilliant question. And in all the conversations I've had, no one's asked that question. Hmm. Um, maybe the best way to answer that is to describe a little bit about my own relationship because that's Mm -hmm. what I try to do is rather than go to this general and the universal start with the specific by way of much more valuable too so um, one of the things that I explored in that first difficult chapter was the role of money in my life And if you recall, um, I grew up with a lot of uh, violence and insecurity in the household. And um, there was, um, I had a mentally ill mother and an alcoholic father. So arguably both parents were mentally ill. And, um, but it wasn't just that, it was also the sense of literally worrying about whether or not there was enough food um my father lost his job um, when i was 10 and that and that really um profoundly impacted me and a source of stability in my life were, were my mother's parents uh dominic and nicoletta guido dominic guido was a an iceman in brooklyn and uh like a lot of italian american immigrants or italian immigrants he um, would deliver ice and coal to different households. And he always seemed to have enough. And he was very hardworking. He had no more than a sixth grade education. But we would go, my my younger brother and I in particular would go there and there was always, you know, some great soup on the stove or some wonderful, meatballs that my grandmother would have made or something you know she would be she handmade pasta and there would be pasta drying on a rack in the dining room now my mouth is watering of <laughs> course, I, would, too, yeah. <laughs> I would steal um the uncooked pasta it was terrible for me but i would eat the uncooked pasta you know and one of the things that they always had uh was this pantry filled with food in particular this tin that was always filled with lemon drops my grandfather loved lemon drops. And so in my mind, I began associating lemon drops with having enough money. As you can tell, I, I, I use a lot of metaphors to understand the world. Later on in my life, when I uh, began pursuing a professional career, and I was variously a journalist, and then as I said before, I became a venture capitalist, I began uh, this almost a relentless pursuit of success. And uh, I remember being dropped to my knees by a question from my therapist at the time who said, when is enough? How much will it take for you to stop almost killing yourself? And when I responded to the question with the phrase Bill Gates, I knew I had a problem because the truth is that the safety I was seeking by accumulating wealth was never going to happen. That, uh, that understanding that I had associated lemon drops with safety and money with lemon drops. And so what I was really pursuing was safety um, was a really complicated and twisted knot to, to, to undo. And so now that belief system still lives within me. I can still occasionally wake up and say, oh my God, I'm going to be poor 
which is actually a metaphor for, or a code word for, hungry, unsafe, hurt, abandoned, subject to violence. And then I get to sort of just breathe and say, wait, like every good entrepreneur, I have freedom. Like most good uh, men, I am loved and I know how to love. And so I am enough, regardless of how many lemon drops I have. Now, I... I tell that story and I dive into that because I want to model for someone else. What is it that I mean when I say explore your relationship to money? It's fascinating. For me, it was Bill Gates as well. Mm. Right. And, but it wasn't about safety. Mm. For me, it was about worth. Right. Right. I'm nothing if I'm not as rich as Bill Gates. Right. Right. I'm, I shouldn't even take up the space that other more worthy people mm. deserve. Right? Mm. I shouldn't even breathe the air that other more worthy people should have. Mm. Yeah. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. It, uh, and, and I, I, here again, I think that, uh, the association that you have or have had or have worked with probably a better way to put it between money as a proxy for worth mm -hmm. right and 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 your relationship to your own sense of self-worth is incredibly powerful and so how did that belief system impact your life, Calvin? Well, it made me for many years chase success, right? It was like, okay, um, how can I have like, you know, something where I can have a hundred million dollar exit, which wasn't going to be enough, right? I mean, it, all this stuff is not, it's not very well thought out, right? It's, it's all sort of in the unconscious, but that was, I was really chasing that. And I would jump into partnerships with people that I thought, because I felt like I was flawed and broken. But if I could hitch my wagon to someone who had the, like the success sauce, um, and then they could make me successful and then I would be okay. And then I would be okay. Yeah. I remember so, actually you know, sitting in your office, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and I think that was one of the moments that I cried on your couch was, was when I, realized that I had this idea that like the super wealthy, like they have their own, they uh, imagine that they have their own roads and like this entire parallel universe where they were never stuck in traffic or mm -hmm. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And you're like, I, I don't think that's real. And I was like, I think you're right. <laughs> they mm -hmm. still get stuck in traffic in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I noticed that when you were telling the story, you looked down. Do you remember that moment? Just now. Just now? Yeah, I, I very vividly remember that moment of sitting there, yeah. No, but I mean, oh. just now, when you were talking about it again and recalled, you looked down. And I was about, just curious, just as you were de describing the feeling and the association with Bill Gates and worth right. and success. Yeah. I still what happens that. for you when you, what happens when you, when you go there for you? When I go there now? Yeah. Yeah. I feel empathy for, I feel empathy for that boy and I can, I can still feel the pain of it, right? The confusion of, of, um, there's some bar I have to hit, but it's very vague and clearly I'm not meeting it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So I just thank you for sharing that because I could feel that coming through. Mm -hmm. um, I could feel that little boy. And um, so what I just saw you do was take care of that boy and, and notice that and pay attention to it. 
uh, to him. And because um, sometimes the reason I, I bring attention to that is that the work that we're talking about doing right now, which is, you know, to use my phrase, radical self-inquiry, to radically inquire into oneself actually can provoke feelings of shame, guilt, profound sadness, right? And so, you know, the big joke around Jerry is uh, he makes people cry, right? And I, it, it's a joke in the sense that that's not what I'm really seeking. What I'm seeking to do is to create the conditions where people can actually both touch into those spaces and feel the feelings that come up. Because the discomfort that we can feel stops us from looking in those spots. Mm -hmm. Because it's uncomfortable. It's painful. Yeah. Yeah. But until we look into those spots, those spots are going to dictate our lives, right? As Carl Jung said, <clears throat> until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and it, you will call it fate. Yeah, and the, and the pain is already there, right? We're just right. connecting to it. And, and, and Right, we're not creating yeah. more pain. No, right. Very good point. Connecting to it, which means that we connect to ourselves, right? There's inner right. connection, um, intimacy with ourselves. Right. Right. Which, oh my God, like that was not the case for me, right? <laughs> There's none of that. I and laugh that, because that's also universal. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like we, 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 we can live where our head is disconnected from our body. That was me. Totally. Yeah. Right. Right. Completely. Right. The body is for where all that mucky feeling stuff is. And the head is going to work its way out and it's going to make us successful. And you're going to be this like prefrontal cortex forward being. Right. And we're going to even use that brain to quote, sit in meditation and be mindful. <laughs> that too. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I remember someone, someone um, saying like how he had this moment. It was actually at, at another Wisdom 2.0 talk, one of the ones that was in New York. Um, and he was talking about how he would realized, he meditated for years, he's a monk. And like one day he had this realization, oh, I can actually feel my feelings on <laughs> meditating instead of using meditation to try to get away from them. <laughs> Was that Andy Puttacombe? Just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, in my uh, spiritual tradition, that's called spiritual bypassing. Yeah, that's a perfect term. It's yeah. it's, uh, but we we bypass a lot. We can do consumer bypassing. We can do uh, work productivity bypassing. We can do relational bypassing. We can do sex bypassing. We, 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 we're very skilled as a species at bypassing our own experience. <laughs> yeah, totally. So what, what needs to change? What needs to happen for that to change? Does that need to change? I guess maybe not, but like. Well, if we scale. look at the consequences of this, right? If we look at the mm -hmm. consequences of let's, let's use the pejorative, somewhat pejorative term that that I use, which is of leaders who are not, in fact, grown-ups. We see the consequences of those who hold power not fully being present with themselves, not fully confronting themselves. We see, we live, we feel, and we die as a result of leaders not actually doing their work. So, you said, D does this have to change? Uh, warning to your editor, I'm about to curse. Fuck yeah. Okay, because here's the truth. It's fine for a privileged, white, cisgendered male to not to go through their life and exhibit their power without any consequences, without, without doing the work, it's fine for them. 
but it's not fine for those of us we seek to lead. We are obligated morally and ethically to grow the hell up. Right. Yeah, as leaders, right? I'm also thinking of, of, I'm totally with you. I'm thinking also of like the population at large, right? Sure. So, so let's, ex- let's expand it, right? Um, imagine entering into a relationship not fully grown up. That happens all the time. Happens every single time, pretty much, right? There is no certification process that says you are here by an adult. Now you can be a parent. Right. Right. Uh, there is no passport that says you have done your inner work. Here's your diploma. Congratulations. And now thank God for that. Cause that, that, <laughs> that would be abused day one. Right. <laughs> but, 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 In games. So, so, you know, yes, you're right. I focused on leaders and what you're really bringing me back to is uh, those of us who don't, don't hold positional power. But the truth is, the, the interdependence that we all exhibit, that we all experience every day, I need you, you need me, that is the f- fundamental common denominator. That is the fundamental driver that makes this a moral imperative. Because if I could literally live like an island and never, ever interact with any other, any other person, then fine, don't grow up. Who cares? <laughs> But the truth is every single day I'm encountering somebody, which means that if I haven't done my work every single day, I am in danger of hurting somebody. How do we, how do we, is is there something that we can do to sort of um, instigate this or make this happen at scale in society, like helping people grow up? Uh, So you want, you, you want to participate in the revolution. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's call for that revolution. And it's an inner revolution. So here's the way I'm processing the pandemic right now. Mm. I don't know that I've ever seen, to use your term, scale, suffering on this scale. And I don't know that I've ever experienced something where without hyperbole, we can speak of all of humanity. Okay, that's the scale. It will be a damn tragedy compounding the suffering if we come out of this period unresolved to do better. Now, we have to be clear. We are still within the container of being human, which means we're frail, we're fraught with ego, we have enormous difficulties. From a Buddhist perspective, it is the truth of samsara. But to me, to extend the Buddhist metaphor, the the bodhisattva vow is the right stance from where I sit. And the bodhisattva vow, a bodhisattva, if you, I know you know this, but I'll say it for the audience. The bodhisattva is one who is able to take enlightenment and not, and move on to nirvana and not be trapped in samsara forever. Think about that. That's the holy grail. But the Bodhisattva says no to enlightenment. Not until the rest of the world is free from suffering. Okay. And for me, this pandemic is calling for the Bodhisattva vow. What will I do to contribute to the revolution? We think this is bad, wait till climate change really hits us. This is, this is the run up to. And what are we doing about that? And unless leaders, people who have positional power are willing to do this, we will continue the cycles of samsara. So, so what is the, so for all the people that are suffering right now, what is what, what is your, what is the story that you want to share with them that helps them down this path? Of maturity? Same story. We're all suffering. Mm-hmm. This, 
there's a there's an old Buddhist tale that um, a woman who's lost her child comes to the Buddha and, and with this indescribable grief. I don't know what to do with this. And the Buddha's advice to her was to go to every house in the village and collect a mustard seed from every home that has not experienced grief and suffering. And she comes back to him empty handed. And the point of that story is not to diminish the extent of her grief, but to show her the interconnectedness of all grief and suffering. And so if we can rise to that occasion and see that how we are each experiencing suffering is different. Some have more physical suffering, some have more mental suffering, some react with anger and defiantly say, fuck this, I'm not gonna wear a mask. And some say, I have to mask up on every case, right? But we're all suffering. So let's get that straight. What will you do with the knowledge that you are not alone? That's the call. Embrace someone, the, see them, see their suffering, right? What you, your impulse was the right impulse, compassion. Mm -hmm. The antidote to suffering is compassion. My suffering, your suffering, the guy down the street suffering, the people who storm a state capital demanding that barbershops be open, carrying assault weapons. They're suffering. I may not like their behavior, they are suffering. To diminish their suffering diminishes my suffering. So the right response is to see the universality of it. And in that, take comfort in knowing that we are in this together. Humanity, all of us, no exceptions. Even the people we can't stand, no exceptions. Start there, then we'll figure it out. All right, mic drop. <laughs> I get a little fired up. <laughs> no, it's like I'm like, all right. <laughs> well, I, you can also tell I've been thinking a lot about the pandemic and and talking yeah. to a lot of people and. Um, I said to Sharon Salzberg, who's my teacher, um, a few weeks ago, I made her cry. True fact. All right, good job. We were talking about this experience, and I and she said, "Jerry, where where is this fire coming from?" And I looked at her across my Zoom screen, and I said, "It's coming from you. You trained me for sixteen years to sit my butt on a cushion and to feel everything." This is go time. Calvin, I'll say the same thing to you. This is go time, dude. This is why you went through what you went through. Do you see that now? Because that you, touched, yeah. you touched into suffering and now you can reach empathy. Mm -hmm. And empathy and love and compassion arise just like the lotus out of the mud. Touch the dangerous place. Touch the painful place. Your pain. You know, earlier this week, I, I didn't want to get out of bed. I miss my kids. They're 30, 27, 22. And I can't tell you when I'm going to hug them again. Yeah. Another Buddhist tale, it reminds me of the tale of the woman, the armless woman who's trapped on the shore of a river watching her baby float down the river. Talk about helpless. 
My kids I'm are, not. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's just uh, my kids are 12 and 14 and stuck in stuck in Denmark, and I yeah I can't see them. They were supposed to be here last month, and that obviously didn't happen. And yeah. Zoom helps, mm. but yeah. it's not the same. It's not the same. <laughs> I mean, you want to rub your kid's head, right? right? You yeah. want to roll in the grass with them and and laugh, you know, and and and. We can't even say with certainty when we'll be able to do that again. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, it's freaking crazy time and very, very challenging for a lot of people. But, but you know, my way out of that pain is to remember that you have kids in Denmark. And to remember that like me, you suffer. And so I don't have to be alone in the suffering. And therefore I can be there for you in this way. All right. Um, I don't, there's lots of questions that I have for you, but I feel like we've, <laughs> we've, we've reached a, like a nice, a good sort of, um, end point here. Really. Um, yeah. is there anything that you want to leave people with or you feel like you've, you're complete here? Yeah. The only thing I would say is, um, something happened spontaneous to me, spontaneously to me a few weeks ago. I was, I was doing, um, I don't know, some Instagram TV thing. I've never done that before. It's like, so I feel very hip. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> and um, I was working with a group of people who, who are in the meditation company Core, which has a device that helps people meditate. And someone asked, well, what, what, should, what should a beginning meditator um, remember? And I very spontaneously just said, probably because Bill Ritter had just passed, lean on me, the song. And um, I think that there's a profound truth in that spontaneous impulse, which was um, we need to lean on each other. That's the lesson for me. And those of us who struggle with asking for help, guilty as charged, um, it's a time to alter the trajectory of that pattern and to say, no, I need help today. No, I'm struggling today. And in a similar fashion, reach out to someone else and say, hey, are you okay? I was just thinking about you. Um, one of the real delights that for me has been um, the way people are signing off emails and phone calls with stay safe. So Calvin, stay safe. Thank and you. may your children in Denmark and all those that you love, may they stay safe. Thank you. Yeah. And like, same to you. Same to you. Yeah. Any, um, where, where can people follow you, stay up to date with you and what you're doing? Um, probably the best thing. I mean, first of all, the book website is rebootbyjerry.com. And it's chock full of lovely pictures and uh no i'm kidding podcasts and that sort of stuff but twitter is probably the the thing that i'm most active on so that's at jerry colonna right. and um yeah just go have fun remember that uh the grass is still green and the sky is still blue it is yeah all right thank you so much jerry really really appreciate you and your time it's amazing it's been thank, thank you for having see you me. again. You yeah. too. You too. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast episode. After 20 years as a serial spiritual entrepreneur, it's my passion to share lessons, insights, and ideas that I picked up along the way. So please subscribe and share if you found any value from today's conversation. 